Ok. So, Ongi Torri Gustioi, bienvenidos a, a todos a estas charlas de eh, ICUR Quantum. En primero, eh, esta será la primera charla de este ciclo de, de conferencias, entonces os quiero explicar qué consiste en estas charlas de ICUR Quantum. Es una iniciativa del Gobierno Vasco, está coordinada por eh, BECAM, de IPC y la Universidad del País Vasco, la UPV, EHU. Y lo, eh, lo que tratamos es traer eh, científicos de, de, alto, de alto nivel eh, a nivel mundial a, a Euskadi, al País Vasco, para que eh, hagan charlas a nivel popular, también científicas, en, los, eh, en las capitales de, de Euskadi. Esta, en esta ocasión es la, la primera vez que eh, contamos con Machek Levenstein, es profesor de eh, ICREA en, en, en Barcelona, en, en ICFO, y bueno, él ha trabajado en muchos aspectos dentro de las tecnologías cuánticas, gases fríos, teoría de entanglement, de entrelazamiento, tiene un grupo de unas 30 personas y ha sido distinguido con un montón de, 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 de premios dentro de Europa y a nivel, a nivel mundial. Hoy nos va a hacer una, una charla eh, bueno, controvertida eh, en el que nos va a hablar sobre eh, qué son los simuladores cuánticos, en unas, unas máquinas que nos va a explicar qué son y qué, qué es lo que se espera de ellas en, la, en, las, en las próximas décadas. Por cierto, eh, si hay alguna duda, hay preguntas, comentarios, lo que sea, al final de, de la charla eh, pues, eh, levantáis la mano y, y aclaramos todas las dudas y las preguntas que haya. ¿vale? Gracias. Muchas gracias por la invitación aquí en Bilbao, es un gran honor y un placer. Pero uh, I will speak in English. But I understand that those of you who want to have it in Euskera can use this um, translators, right? Okay, can you hear me well with this thing? Okay. Now, how does this work? I don't know. It worked, but uh, ah, now it is. So the title of my talk is coming the, the Coming Decades of Quantum Simulators or Quantum Computers of Special Purpose. I always start my talks with this uh, logos of the organizations that pay for the research and ICFO of my quantum optics group. Uh, many logos means uh, man, a lot of money and indeed there is 30 people at this moment uh, mm, working on very many aspects of contemporary theoretical physics, including classical statistical physics. And we collaborate with a lot of people, ex-members and collaborators all over the world. This is a photo from the retreat in uh, Delta del Ebro a couple of years ago. It's not the full group, but part of it at least. Okay, before I <coughs> come to the... Um, To the uh, essence of the talk, I will start. Uh, again, this is a popular talk. You are supposed to be simple people and not understand anything, and you are not. <laughs> so please fall asleep and don't look at me, all right? Four truths about quantum mechanics you should know, but you never dared to ask. So one is that quantum mechanics, of course, is involved with this duality between particles and waves which is represented in this photo where the um, drop of water falls on the surface and creates the radial waves. <clears throat> and this duality is, of course, very um, important because it means that particles do not behave like uh, um, balls of billiard, but rather they can also have second nature as wave packets. Uh, and uh, uh, in effect, <clears throat> Particles uh, uh, are governed by superposition principles and they can interfere like waves on this figure. The most extreme example of this superposition principle and, uh, and interference is, of course, uh, Schrodinger cat proposed by Schrodinger many years ago. So the, uh, the particles can be in two states which interfere one with another or which are superposition of what in another and the cat can be simultaneously in a superposition of the state in which it, uh, he is alive or <coughs> dead. Uh, on the other hand, we never see this kind of effects uh, in common life. And why is it so? Because quantum, these superpositions are very fragile. I mean, whatever we do with them, we measure, we observe, then we destroy them and therefore When we start measuring, and this is what in quantum mechanics is told, that the measurement affects the measured. Okay? When I observe something, I, I affect it very strongly. This is not so strange because 
we are macroscopic and we observe microscopic things. So it's clear that if I go with a hammer to a small thing, then I can affect it. But in quantum mechanics, this is really an intrinsic effect. And indeed, if I observe a Schrodinger of cat, <clears throat> this measurement affects it, and I either see it uh, dead or alive, but at once dead and alive, uh, practically it's impossible. And the final thing that I want to mention is about um, correlations in quantum mechanics, which is um, uh, known under the name of entanglement. So these correlations can be much uh, more strong than in uh, classical uh, statistical mm, theory. So in which sense? I mean, imagine that I have two, two balls, one black and one white, and I give white to Enrique, and Enrique goes to the moon. Obviously, if he sees uh, that he has white, he knows that I have black, because they are anticorrelated. But the problem is that in quantum mechanics, the colors are not predefined. So he can ask his ball, is it 30% gray? And if the answer is yes, then he knows that mine is 70% gray. Okay? And this is something which classically is not possible. What exists is not the colors, but anticorrelation between the colors. And this I cannot express in a different way by some using some artistic imagination. OK, so now let's uh, talk, come to the talk. I will start a little provocative, especially in the context of the fact that IBM is going to install together with the Basque government this quantum computer here. So I will talk about hype of quantum computing. OK, it's my opinion. Quantum simulators, then I will introduce ideology and what they are. Uh, and I will show you some examples where they can be useful and things like that. I will not talk about diagnostic design because there will be no time. Okay, so quantum computing. Uh, classical computers and classical information processing uh, is essentially independent of the, of the uh, devices. So I can do this, the rules that govern processing of information are the same for mechanical machines proposed in the 18th century and for supercomputing, supercomputers using electronics. Only speed and memories are different. Basic information processing unit is a bit, which can have two states, zero or one. And classical computers obviously have limitations, we know it. There are tasks uh, which are difficult, if not possible, for them. Even this first statement that I made in the, in the top, that information processing is device independent, is not true. And this goes back to Rolf Landauer, who indicated that obviously every logical operation must have a thermodynamical cost. I mean, you cannot do erase a bit without uh, uh, spending some energy for that. So oh, this is uh, Rolf Landauer, who was uh, working in IBM at that time. And his doctorant was uh, the father of quantum information processing, Charles Bennett. In quantum information processing, typically we say that the um, information processing strongly uh, depends on devices, because we have to use the laws of quantum mechanics, the laws of microscopic world. The basic information unit is qubit, which again has two basis states, 0 and 1, but it can be in superposition, as I told you, because uh, quantum mechanical particles can be in superposition states, uh, which are even uh, uh, described mathematically with some coefficients, which are complex numbers and things like that. And quantum computers are, um, for the fact that they use this superposition, intrinsically parallel and maybe much faster than classical ones. But they also have limitations because, as I told you, quantum superpositions live short. They are very fragile because when I look at them, I destroy them usually. Interaction with external worlds destroy them. Uh, this is Charles Bennett, and uh, maybe I should well, there is no time, I will not comment on that, but nowadays it's also very mm, important and popular to try to formulate quantum information processing in the device-independent way, only looking on probabilities of the outcomes of measurements, and this assures a better security in quantum communication and things like that. 
Okay, what are the quantum, uh, universal quantum computers that we talk about uh, in the recent years very um, intensively? Quantum computer realizes essentially something which we in mathematics call a unitary operator, which is an isometry, acting on a vector space of these qubits. Qubits have two uh, states, so you can think about it that it is a vector looking up or looking down. It can look in any direction because it can be in this superposition uh, state, but uh, roughly speaking, this is the idea. And now um, the um, isometry is a rot collective rotation of these vectors such that it keeps, of course, the length of the vectors unchanged, but it rotates them in some complex and complicated way. Uh, Mm, this uh, space in which these qubits live or these vectors live is called uh, Hilbert space, doesn't matter, but if I have n qubits, then dimension of this space is 2 to the power n, so it can be huge. If n is 100 or 1000 or God knows what, it can be very huge. And you can think about it that this collection of these uh, vectors up and down, which are uh, which can also look in other directions and which interact one with another. So it's a many-body quantum system. Uh, there is another way of looking at quantum computers, which is uh, that it is a quantum circuit. So uh, cal calculations in uh, quantum computing correspond to applying quantum gates, single qubit gates, two qubit gates, like in classical computers, except that here we talk about quantum gates and not the uh, the classical logical gates. Uh, universal quantum computer therefore requires, of course, universal set of quantum gates. In, uh, typically, it would be all single qubit rotations and um, one uh, two qubit gate, for instance, control not gate or XOR gate, so excluded or uh, gate, similar like uh, in classical logic. And then uh, when we look at the quantum computer from that point of view, then of course we can represent it as a kind of sequence of application of these gates, okay? Single qubit gates, so time here runs from left to the right. There are single qubit gates applied there are, uh, on this. There are five qubits here. There are two qubit gates applied, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what is the problem with these uh, devices? The problem with these devices is that in order to make them functioning uh, well, we need to control the errors. And the, uh, this is done with the techniques similar in classical informatics, which are called uh, mm, fault-tolerant error correction. Now, in order to have one logical qubit, which is uh, fault tolerant error corrected, I need 10,000 additional qubits in order to achieve the fidelity, so what, which is a kind of measure of how good it works of the order of um, 10 to minus 3 uh, error per gate for so-called paradigmatic surface code, whatever it means. The point is that I need 10 to 10,000 additional qubits in order to make one qubits working without errors. And this is impossible, because if I want to have 100 qubits in my computer, then I need million. And this we don't have yet. We have machines which will have 500, maybe 1,000, but we don't have these things. And then the second thing is that also error per gate should be independent of the size of the device. This is also not the case in the present devices. That's why John Preskill some time ago proposed to seek for quantum advantage in noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, which are what IBM will bring to Bilbao. Uh, the uh, first experiment on this was a famous experiment by Google, uh, published in Nature um, some time ago, three years ago, I don't remember, quantum supremacy using programmable superconducting processors. Uh, these are qubits which are done by um, so-called Josephson junction, whatever superconductors are involved in that. In principle, these are what these people do. They have a chip on which they have a network of these uh, qubits. Con uh, they can apply gates to these qubits, and the gates have quite good fidelity, quite high, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what they do at the end, they um, apply a random circuit to these qubits. And at the end, at the output, they measure the state of the output qubits. And this 
sampling problem apparently has been proven rigorously that it's uh, very difficult to be solved, to be uh, described by the classical computers. So that's why Google made this measurement. And then they claim that what they measured is 10 years faster than everything that uh, can be done on the world. Two days later, IBM claimed that it's only two and a half days, not 10 years, only two and a half days, and so on. But one thing that this uh, experiments on uh, quantum advantage has stimulated is the work of physicists and computer scientists to improve the classical codes. And these Chinese guys have improved the so-called tensor network method. And in particular, in August last year, they published a paper in which they beat with classical simulation the Google experiment. Of course, you may say this is not scalable, but the other is also not scalable, because no one do, does it now for, so it's, this is how the situation is. So my uh, declaration, which is this provocative one, quantum advances of NISC is in useless problems so far when they are beaten by tensor network methods. There are things that NIST cannot do at this stage. You may like it or not. This is the paper that appeared in this month, two weeks ago. Matthias Stroyer, one, uh, one of the gurus of this area, um, he is, uh, the title is on realistically achieving quantum uh, advantage. And indeed, what uh, these people say um, is that trying to do quantum advantage in this rigorously proven things is, doesn't make sense, really. There are, uh, it's much more important to maybe have advantage in practical problems in which maybe nothing is rigorously proven, but at least we uh, think that we, we believe that we have advantage. And the three uh, main um, insights of this paper uh, is that most of today's quantum algorithms may not achieve practical speeding. This is in particularly true for attempts to do uh, quantum uh, computation in quantum chemistry and in optimization problems. Due to the limitation of input and output bandwidth, quantum computers will be practical, will be practical for big compute problems on small data. So not big data. Okay. And finally, quadratic speedups delivered by the algorithms like a famous search algorithm of Glover are too slow to be really practically important for to beat the supercomputers. So this is the situation for today. It's not so good. In the last two years, there were a lot of articles criticizing exactly what's going on. So what can we do? And what can we do is we can do things which have practical advantage, and these are these quantum simulators. So quantum simulators are uh, the ideology of these systems is very simple. There exist many interesting quantum phenomena, such as conduct superconductivity, for instance. These phenomena have uh, important applications. This phenomena, I will come back, of course, to this in a second. The phenomena are often difficult to be described and understood with the help of standard computers. So why not uh, use another simpler, better controllable quantum systems to simulate, understand, and control these phenomena? This goes back to Richard Feynman, one of the last papers of Feynman uh, from the beginning of the 80s. Such system would uh, thus work as quantum computer of special purpose, that is, uh, this quantum simulator. OK, this is fine. One. So uh, what are the platforms possible for, for this uh, system? I already mentioned the superconducting qubits can be used for universal quantum computing, but they also can be used for simulations, because simulations can be digital or uh, continuous style or analog. Uh, OK. Ultra-cold atoms is another platform which is very um, popular. Trapped ions, Rydberg atoms, these are atoms which are excited to some non, some states of uh, not so low energy, and therefore they have interesting properties. They behave like a huge dipoles, um, electric dipoles and things like that. Circuit QED is superconducting qubits, but in the microcavities. Uh, photonic systems, photonic systems, and so on, many platforms. And the task and goals so far are, of course, in the following order. First of all, we can do these quantum simulations to study fundamental problems of physics. So we are, unfortunately, with us. 
But in the future, people hope that there will be applications in quantum chemistry and there will be application in quantum uh, classical or quantum optimization problems relevant for technology. Uh, the uh, coming decades should concentrate, this is what people are saying on, uh, and this is what quantum flagship in Europe is saying essentially, quantum simulators should be more robust, should be scalable, should be programmable, they should allow for external access, so cal calculation in the cloud, like the IBM uh, computer al allows, and they should be standardized and verifiable. So you have to verify and validate what you do. And the task and goals probably in the next 10 years will change the order. The classical quantum optimization problems will become the most relevant. Quantum chemistry probably the second, and the fundamental problems of physics will be there because they are very important and relevant for us. But probably for the general humanity, they will be not so. Okay, so now I will give you some uh, examples of these uh, systems where you can do this quantum simulation. So paradigmatic, notoriously difficult, uh, but relevant systems, et cetera, et cetera. I will not talk about diagnostic because there is no time. So let me start with paradigmatic, notoriously difficult, but relevant system. And this is, of course, I'm going to talk about um, superconductivity. So superconductors are ideal condu uh, conductors that conduct electric currents without resistance. They conduct strong currents without losses. So obviously, if we have uh, superconductors in cables here, uh, on the Earth, we would solve all the energy problems of human, of mankind, but we don't have them. Uh, and I will tell you why in a second. They can generate very strong magnetic fields outside of them, but due to the so-called meissner oxenfeld effect, they do not let magnetic fields to enter them. So if you cool, if you think about this ball to be a superconductor, if you cool it below critical temperature, it pushes away the magnetic field lines. Unfortunately, they exist only at very low temperature, normally close to absolute zero or at temperatures of order of boiling of liquid nitrogen steel. This is not very good for sending electricity um, in this room. Uh, so what are the applications of superconductivity? First of all, you can get Nobel Prize, and there were many Nobel Prize, so it's a very important application, okay? So uh, Lef Landau to some extent, Piotr Kapica, uh, John Bardeen, uh, Leon Cooper, and uh, John Schrieffer, uh, Esaki Gaever, and um, Brian Josephson, Bednosh and Miller for this high TC superconductivity, Leggett Abrikos of Ginsburg. Uh, even the price in 2016, to some extent, for given for theoretical uh, discoveries of topological phases, is also related to topological aspects of superconductivity. Uh, uh, they also got the so-called Ig Nobel, so improbab for improbable research. So this is this kind of uh, um, a prize that you get for um, the most stupid research that you can imagine. This was the get by a very famous scientist, Andre Geim, who got actually the real Nobel for graphene in 2010, and Sir Michael Berry. And uh, they got it for this. For uh, They used the superconducting magnet. Does it work? Yes. To levitate the frog. Okay. So, of course, the frog was a little pissed off, but it survived, and so it was uh, good. It was not a brutal experiment. Okay. Okay, another thing that is a little more maybe interesting is that this levitating can be used for practical purposes. So, here you have a short movie about um, toys still. So this is a levitating train. This train doesn't touch the rails. And it will be explained in a moment how it works. So they say it's floating, but... Uh... So the idea here is to um, use this uh, mentioned already Meissner-Ochsenfeld 
um, effect. So inside of this train, there are three superconducting disks. The train, as you could see, was in the temperature of liquid uh, nitrogen boiling, so minus 166. So this disk push the uh, magnetic field away from them, like shown here, okay? And now what you do is you take a three normal magnets, which have certain uh, lines of magnetic field, and you put the disk in the middle, yeah, and it forms this kind of um, corridor, I don't know how to say, if you make the whole, I think it's clear, okay? So you can really levitate or float inside of this. And now you just put the train on top and you have the thing. All right, you can do it with the cars and so on. And of course, also it is interesting that there are real trains like that. This is a simul computer simulation from uh, Holland from the train that is supposed to connect Amsterdam with Schiphol Airport. But I have used such a train in Shanghai and it was going 500 um, kilometers per hour to the airport. So these are things that are more useful. Um, now, how to do what this has to do with simulators? I mean, we, many of us believe that there exists a simple model that cap captures the phenomenon of this superconductivity. Uh, which is called the Hubbard model. Unfortunately, even this simple model is very far, uh, is far too hard to simulate and to understand with existing computers. So why not try to mimic it with uh, something like uh, ultra-cold atoms? The Hubbard model has, essentially you can think about it like a box for the eggs, where the eggs are electrons that move in condensed matter, and they can uh, do two things. First of all, uh, they have two colors because the electron can have, again, spin like a qubit. It can have vector which looks up or vector that looks down. It's a kind of increasing angular momentum of electron. And this uh, means it's represented in this figure by colors, red and blue. Now, two electrons of the same color cannot be in the same place at the same time because of the so-called Pauli principle, but two of different colors can, and then they interact. Mm, they repulse each other in the small one, typically. On top of that, they can jump from one place to another, or hop, or tunnel, actually, because they are waste packets, so they can tunnel, really, through the barriers. So tunneling is one mechanism that allows them to move from one place to another, and interaction is another. Everything can be written in this simple formula here, which is very short, so as you can imagine, this is trivial. But it's not trivial, because it's very difficult to simulate this model with standard um, classical computers. So <clears throat> why is it difficult? Well, the simplest thing you can think about is just a question of memory. If I have one qubit, which is like one electron, so which can have spin up, spin down, I have to I have the two configurations with the coefficients that are complex numbers. If I have n qubits, I need 2 to the power n complex numbers. And now you can make estimate. If n is 100, 2 to the power 100 is 10 to the power 30, roughly, complex numbers, which is millions of millions of millions of millions of millions. And when you go to higher numbers, then there is no memory of the computer. There is no enough atom in, atoms in the world to memorize this thing. OK? So that's, uh, in, in Barcelona, I would say even Mare Nostrum will not help here. I would say even your IBM uh, quantum computer will not help. OK, so what can you do? And this is, goes back 20 years ago, actually, that people proposed that to use ultra-cold atoms. So what they do is they put uh, three standing waves of lasers. And the lasers, of course, have electric field which oscillates in time, and, uh, but has a spatial profile, uh, which is periodic. Um, and electric field causes a so-called Stark effect in the atom, shifts the energy levels in the atom, acts as a ki kind of force on the atoms, which in the first approximation is very rapidly oscillating, so you can uh, average this oscillation, but the, there is a non-trivial quadratic Stark effect which causes the potential for the atoms, which looks like, uh, like this thing on the right. So the balls here are not atoms, but the places in which atoms can sit. 
And this has been down, uh, proposed by Ted Hens many years ago and realized by Marcus Greiner, Olaf Mandel, Tillman Esslinger, and Immanuel Bloch um, 20 years ago, maybe. So they can put ultra-cold atoms into this kind of structure, and then they can realize something which is very similar to this Hubbard model that I mentioned. OK, so now let's uh, see how it looks in, in, um, in experiments. But before I go to the Hubbard model, I first think what is amazing in this atomic experiment is that you have ability of applying a so-called quantum gas microscopes, which allow you to measure single atoms in a single site of this lattice, which is amazing in a sense. This is absolutely not available in condensed matter physics or anywhere. And this is the first, I mean, the first microscope was constructed by Markus Greiner and Immanuel Bloch uh, earlier for bosonic atoms. This is one of the first papers about fermionic atoms, so atoms that are analogs of electrons. Uh, and this is how it works. I mean, it's, you really make a photograph in which you have these white dots are individual atoms in individual places in the optical lattice. And that's very beautiful. So what do we do with the Hubbard model? This is one of the last papers by uh, by the Marcus Greiner group. The experiment was led by um, Daniel Greif. And what they do here is um, they are uh, observing the system with the so-called small doping. What does it mean? It means that they have, in principle, a lot of electrons in the, in the lattice, but they make some holes. There. Not too many, but some number of holes, controlled, actually. Now, this means that in this phase diagram, which I have here on the right-hand side, this is small doping. So we are for low temperatures, we are in this blue region, which is called antiferromagnetic order, which means that these atoms like to be spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, antiferromagnetic. And this, or in the language of colors, it's blue, uh, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Now they take one uh, empty place here, and they look for the dynamics of this empty place, and, uh, of this hole, if you wish. And as you can see, this hole, when it moves, it leaves behind this kind of uh, line of three blue ones, three red ones, so breaks the antiferromagnetic order and leaves this kind of new structures. And they can observe it in the real time, in the real thing. And that's amazing because this allows, if you have two of these holes, you can ask well, how do they interact one with another, and then you start to get information about what is the most interesting here, which is this part of the diagram here with this small dome, which is the high TC superconducting state. And this is what they want to understand with these experiments. So we are far from understanding it still. But there is a huge progress in controlled experiments where you can see the things which are not otherwise possible in condensed matter. OK, what people are also trying to do, and uh, Enrique is one example who uh, works on these things, are the models of uh, uh, high energy physics. So you try to make simulators for high energy physics. This is a paper by uh, Rainer Blatt group where they uh, study the, what they call real space dynamics of lattice gauge theories with the few qubit quantum computer. This time it are uh, trapped ions. So the model that they study is a so-called Schwinger model, which is uh, one dimensional, one space dimension and one dimension in time model of quantum electrodynamics, essentially. So of the theory that we know from uh, high school, we should, at least. Um, well, maybe quantum electrodynamics, no, but electrodynamics, for sure. And, uh, and this is what they do. They reduce somehow this whole uh, complicated model to uh, qubits, to describe it with the help of qubits. And qubits are the strapped ions, which can have two states. And they study the, in this case, they study the instability of the so-called vacuum with respect to production of pair. Um, very beautiful experiment. Uh, theory was done by Peter Zoller group, I guess. 
Uh, we also worked on this kind of models with, uh, with uh, my people. And uh, we also studied this finger model, but this time not for uh, fermionic atoms, but for bosonic atoms. The bosons are a little easier for um, uh, experimentalists to, to achieve. The, I didn't say what bosons and fermions are, but there are two kinds of uh, atoms or particles in the world. And one have properties that they don't like to be in the same place at the same time. These are fermions. And the others, they like to be in the same place in the, in the same time. These are bosons. So we did this for the bosons. And again, um, the, um, what you can do with this designed quantum simulator, which is what we theorists do. I didn't say that. But our aim is to design these quantum simulators and tell the experimentalists what interesting they could do. And then uh, what we study here is, is a phenomenon that we produce. Uh, there, are, uh, there are two kinds of particles in the model. So there is particle and antiparticle. You create a pair particle, antiparticle. This is like a meson in uh, high energy physics. And you let it go. And it goes, goes, it spreads. In principle, you would like to see that it thermalizes. And so it doesn't, because there is a phenomenon known in uh, quantum field theory of confinement. These uh, particles are confined, and therefore they start to oscillate forever in, the, in time. Uh, what else I have for you here? The, uh, this is another uh, thing that we have been uh, working. So here is a quantum simulator, which is really done in a condensed matter system. But the system is the following, that you have, a, you have this um, uh, carbon nanotube, nanotube, which is uh, suspended in two places. So it can uh, oscillate like a string, simply. And our friend uh, Adrian Bachtel puts four uh, quantum dots on top of that. And the electrons can be distributed in this quantum dot. So it can be maximally two electrons per dot spin up, spin down. Uh, and he studies what, uh, what are the states of this thing. So this is, again, in principle, small system. But it's already very difficult to simulate, because here the electrons interact with phonons, with oscillations of this. And you can have a lot of these phonons. And therefore, the simulation is, is uh, very complicated. We, in fact, have um, continued the studies to uh, look for the open system approach to this kind of uh, simulator in which you put something, you have a leads, you put something from the left and you see what comes out on the, on the right. So now it's more complicated because you have to simulate the open system dynamics. And uh, the other thing that we also do is, uh, this is one of our specialities, is I, we study the simulators of systems where the particles interact via longer range interactions. In particular, they are like dipoles. So like uh, dipolar thing, this is a nature paper from last year with our friend Francois Dubin from um, Nice now, where uh, we study extended Hubbard model of excitons in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the two-dimensional uh, uh, lattice, which is created by the surface electrodes. They create these pairs of electron and, and hole um, that are like dipole moments. So it's charge plus, charge minus. And these guys can, because they uh, repulse each other, they can form a state which was not uh, uh, observed before and which is called checkerboard state. So every second, um, every second side of the lattice is occupied by it by the particle. So these are the tricks that we do. And I think this is to time to conclude. So enjoy physics and beyond. Our way of enjoying physics is to uh, combine it with the music, actually. So I have a very strong uh, program. Uh, I, mean, I write books about uh, avant-garde music. But the, the, the music mm, thing is that we try to really sonify some simple quantum mechanical processes by transforming or translating them into sounds. And I have a postdoc who is a composer who is 
taking care of making it beautiful. Of course, it's the music of the style of John Cage or Karl Heinz Stockhausen, so most of you probably doesn't like it, but still, I will give you the example. We had a concert at Sonar Festival. Those of you who know the, is it playing? Does it? Well, no music then. I don't know why. Anyway, so I'm very sorry, but it, it worked before. So this is a um, composition for tape by the guy whose name is Andres Levin Richter, who is one of the fathers of electroacoustic music in Spain. Uh, he was an assistant of those of you who are interested in contemporary music of Edgar Varese in Princeton, Columbia uh, in the 60s. And uh, he's now 87 years old, but he made a composition for tape for this concert. And he's accompanied here by the free improviser Vasco Tria, who create sounds which, which, which he calls from drums and percussion, but they are much more complicated and sound sometimes like something. So this is what we do, okay? We have also an LP published, vinyl LP last year. So thank you very much. Gonzalo. Hi, Maciek. Nice talk. I, I guess I have to ask you about something you described as being controversial about the quantum computer. Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's an important tension uh, here in the Basque country in particular because we have this contrast between the Basque government enthusiasm and even the public enthusiasm and the company's enthusiasm about the, about the quantum computer. And on the other hand, I would say most of us as physicists are, well, skeptical. I would say skeptical, realistic, pessimistic, call it whatever you want to call it. So there is a tension, no? And we have to navigate that a, yes. in, that, in that contrast. And I, I, well, I don't know about Catalonia in this respect. I don't know if the Catalonian government is also pushing hard yes, for this. Yes. Buying. I, mean, I know that already, in Galicia they, they are, buy, yes. in Galicia they want to buy one also. Uh, in, in, in Barcelona they also super conduct, uh, super computing yeah. center. This Mare Nostrum also have bought already a machine. So well, how do you navigate? In I this think that one has extension? to. I mean, there are. First of all, our role is evidently to avoid hype and avoid uh, bubble. We have to be not to give the uh, how do you say promises which are oversold. I think that this is an obvious thing that I'm saying, and this we see in the last because all this thing about the bubble was three years ago. And in the last two years, there is really uh, 20 papers by serious people who say, look, we have to be careful. I didn't sign them here because this is for general public, but there is questions about uh, application in quantum chemistry. There is questions about application in machine learning. There is questions about application in this optimization problem and things like that. So, and this is really last two years, I would say, the, 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 this kind of general vision of, of, of the people. So I think that we should be careful with overselling, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, invest in this uh, science. I think that what I'm trying to say, all these machines that you are going to have can serve, for instance, as, as simulations. And, and then maybe you cannot prove rigorously that you have advantage, but every sane physicist will tell you, yes, of course you have. You study the dynamics of many body and quantum system. Of course, this is not doable in classical uh, computer. So this is what I. This is what my thing is that this tension can be reduced if you focus on the right 
thing. If you don't claim that, uh, you know, that you will have uh, quantum advantage in uh, bosonic sampling. So your point is one can use this. One can, these there's things. a very useful After thing. All, one has there is to a good study, use, there is a good and use there is them. a lot of good uses. This is what I'm saying. This is what is my message, essentially. Okay? So good luck with your uh, <laughs> IBM computer and use it for useful things. But not, f as I'm saying, I mean, not for the things which are not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which are advertised as, as fantastic applications. Yeah. yeah. No. And that you, uh, I mean, quantum chemistry, I mean, there is no result in quantum chemistry that is, uh, as you know, probably, uh, that uh, beats uh, contemporary quantum uh, chemistry classical methods. Yeah. In optimization, <coughs> maybe in the Friedberg atoms that I mentioned here, there are and the works of Lukin and, and others. Maybe there will be something which which can, but still at this moment there is no, uh, there is no really competition to what classical methods can do. So mm, I'm not saying one has to do it, but one has to be serious. No? This is what I'm saying essentially. Thank you. O dudas que han surgido durante la charla. I guess I see it. I haven't seen it. Thanks for the nice talk. I wanted to ask about the music at the end. So what was the quantum part of it? Uh, in, this, uh, in this particular, uh, I mean, this guy who did the tape composition is a guy who belongs to the category which is called uh, algorithmic composers, whatever. And he used the quantum random number generator to generate some of this. Uh, aspects in this. Whether it's beautiful, you tell me. I like it because I like contemporary avant-garde music, but uh, there are, of course. Uh, <coughs> yes. We probably could have done it also with the good uh, classical random number generators, but uh, we also like to do hype, all right? So. <laughs> For the Sonar Festival, it was, of course, I mean, it, that, I mean, how do I see it? I see it also that um, this is a form of, um, how do you say, uh, outreach to the general public, that there is the new technology, which is absolutely, um, without any doubts, useful, which are these quantum random number generators. And in the future, it will be probably used in many security things and so on like that. So, it was, it, is for, it was for me also this kind of thing, that we go to the general public and we say, all right, we can use it for the music. Uh, of course, it's a kind of hype also. I mean, who is, I mean, Vanity Fair. <laughs> Any more? Oh, let it. Um, so, um, what would be the uh, physical phenomena that you can uh, learn more about uh, doing quantum simulations? In your uh, opinion, of course. Well, it's, uh, um, as I'm saying, I mean, these are the many body systems which we don't really uh, understand very often very well, especially if we talk about dynamics which is a, probably the most difficult thing, because while for the statics of this kind of models that I'm saying, there exists quite reasonable uh, classical codes, dynamics is, uh, is very difficult. And this, in principle, you can, you can do, and people do it, OK? So observe the quantum many-body dynamics in an in a, in instance of your model. So what can we learn? Yes, um, 
we not only have to observe, we have to be sure that what we do is also, we have to validate it, as I was saying. So you have to check that what you're doing is really, is really what you want to do. And it's all difficult, but uh, yes. And the, what do you, I mean, what do you learn in general? I mean, it depends on the systems. It's not like we can learn uh, some general theory of something new. No, with concrete quantum simulator, we can learn about concrete family of models, typically. But it depends on this simulator. Thanks. Okay. Me again, sorry. Uh, you have a large group with young people, so probably some of them are playing with ChatGPT. Of course. Maybe you too. Mm -hmm. um, what's your opinion on this? Are, is this going to transform the way we do physics? Is it? Do you well, see I it as an important that, thing, uh, no, or no, just no. as a? Well, I am uh, not afraid of artificial intelligence. I think uh, I'm afraid of people. Um, so this is my first answer. But um, I always quote Gary Kasparov in this, on this occasion. Yes. After uh, this uh, computer won with the Go Master, Gary Kasparov said uh, that everything that we know how to do, the machines will do better, period. Now, if you ask the machine how to prove the Riemann hypothesis, it will not do it. I'm sorry. Okay. So, this is what I think. It's so to some extent it will transform because, of course, there are things that we know how to do, and machines will do it better. But to do it with many things that we are doing, we still don't know. So, I think that uh, we we still gonna be useful for the next. Humans. Mm, ten years at least. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I have a, a, actually a parallel question. So uh, we saw what's the coming decade for quantum simulator. My question is, what do you think is the role of classical emulator or uh, classical computers in the next decade. I mean, one of the things that uh, that I mentioned here also is that all this uh, race for quantum advantage has stimulated extremely uh, efficiently uh, novel quant uh, novel classical algorithms. Okay, so uh, for instance, if you remember D-wave machines at the beginning, at least they were only concentrated on the uh, simulating the ground state of the uh, spin glass model, so a classical spin model with random interactions. And uh, within two years after uh, D-waves were claiming that they are so good, the classical people have c formulated much better algorithms of this problem. This problem has been proven to be NP-hard, so to be very hard for classical uh, computers many years ago, and then it was left because of, okay, it's anti hard, what do we do? Whereas, because of D wave, the people started to look at it and made an improvement in classical algorithms. The same thing is with this tensor network that I just gave. Tensor networks were not so good to, do, to simulate this uh, Google experiment, but the people have sit on that and have, have done it. Similar thing is with cryptography. Look, there is something which is called post-quantum cryptography, which are the new methods of, which are inspired by quantum mechanics, but they are classical methods of cryptography, which are supposed to be, uh, to be competitive with quantum cryptography. So this is what I'm saying. I think it's, this is also an important aspect of all this quantum revolution, that it stimulates the, uh, the classical aspects also. Because only if you can, I mean, if you really want to go for this quantum advantage, then you have to somehow compare always. I'm saying mm, don't be too nervous. Do simulation, and I promise that you are doing well because it's so complex problems that uh, they cannot be easily simulated in classical computers. But if you want to do the boson sampling or things like that, then 
then you need to compare it. So you have to have the best classical codes possible. charla científica en, en San Sebastián. Pero agradecemos a, a Machek otra vez el, que haya dado esta charla.